We have Maggie. Come here. Come here. Say hi to the peoples. I found a dog. What is up, you guys? It's me, your girl, Casey. How you doing? Don't be alarmed. The dog can't actually talk. He's not a freak of nature. He's a cool thing of nature. I'm dog sitting this week, and they have a cooler background than me. So here I am with my camera. So, what the heck is this month? I think it's September. So last month, this is a wrap up of August. It was the worst reading month I've had in forever. Only one book out of the five I read was a three star. Everything else was below that. And I had one DNF. <coughs> Maggie, I told you it's just a demon. She keeps barking at nothing. Maggie, come here. Come here, up here, come on. Why, why do you run away from me too? You're just like all the men in my life. So yeah, nothing in August pleased me. Reading was a bust. Oy! This is Maggie. She's a girl. She's also the reason why I only get three hours of sleep right now. She likes to step on my face while I'm sleeping. But let's talk about the DNF I had this month. It's called Tenth Girl. Actually, you know what? We need to take, excuse me Maggie, we need to take the cover off because I, even though I've only read 30 pages, I am dead certain that the cover and even the little engravings on this actual cover that they contain spoilers, I am this sure. Y you know what I mean, I am this close to feeling sure. But yeah, y'all voted on this book a couple of months ago for me to read. Y'all voted wrong. This is the hardest book I've ever attempted to read. Not hard in that it was, you know, possessing of a lexicon above my feeble mind. No, it's just I couldn't tell what the heck was going on. So in the prologue of this book, The Tenth Girl, we see how this finishing school in Patagonia, I think. You know what, I honestly don't care enough to fact check that. But this really, really rich lady, she buys this house in Patagonia. She turns it into a finishing school. And the most elite of the elite sends their daughters there. World leaders, classic painters, just the fancy schmancy, finger food eating rich folk. And you know, it's very successful for a long time and has the notoriety. But something awful happens. I believe it's like a rash of sicknesses that the people, the workers at this finishing school, they're like, oh, it's a curse from the natives of this land, their spirits, they're flushing us out, ah, stuff like that. So what you gonna do up against spirits? Y you run. <laughs> like a coward. So they abandon the finishing school. The lady who was in charge of it, I'm pretty sure she dies because you know time passes and stuff like that. A couple decades later maybe, they reopen the finishing school. And that's where we find our protagonist. I think her name is Mavi. Bless you Maggie. You're shaking my camera babe. William, what's the best book you've read? I want you to answer me. You're just like the rest of the men I try to text. But Mavi, I don't remember any of her backstory because this book and the 30 pages that, that I read, it just has way too much details about all the stuff it's going around it. Too many weird metaphors, and there's a bigger issue a little bit down the road, but I gotta introduce Mavi What's Her Race. Mavi has applied for this teaching position, but I honestly can't remember if she managed to secure this job by kinda, you know, lying on her resume. There's something fishy going on by the way she got accepted into this school as a teacher but I can't remember what it is. So she arrives, it's like this sheer desolate place. She with her luggage man just like crawl up the mountainside to finally get to this finishing school. She rings the doorbell. Some jerk guy leans over and like spits on her face from an upper floor window. Where he came from? This is like for girls, right? Right there, a dude here. Oh, we gonna fall in love with him? Of course we are. But eventually Mavi gets inside the finishing school. She gets the grand tour, spooky place. Uh, the caretaker spooky lady. Everything's just so stiff and formal. And then we have like a little, you know, next chapter and a new weird personality because Mavi's chapters takes place in like the 70s or the 80s. And now we've time skipped in this new chapter to I felt, I, I think it's the 2020s, but it's so hard to tell what the heck is going on. Now we're in some new girl's point of view. Her name's Angel, but guess what? She's dead. Yeah, she's some type of ghost floating around the finishing school, but she's not a present ghost, because you know, Mavi's in the 70s or 80s. Angel is clearly from the future. She's doing all the references from like our times, Jonas Brothers, all that fine stuff. But for some reason, this angel chick is sent to haunt the finishing school. I don't know why the heck, this book is just so confusing. And I just could not read it. It was like just a major, 
it's not an info dump because it's not explaining what's happening when I really, really want it to explain what's happening. It's just, just too much going on around it. I was gonna DNF it, but I was looking online because I just wanted to know all the spoilers and the summary so I can just see what even this book was trying to be. I couldn't find anything. No one would give me spoilers. But I just found like book reviews about it and people were like, oh my gosh, the twist is either gonna make this book or break it for you. You're gonna love it or you're gonna hate it. And everywhere I went, every website, they're just, oh, the twist, the twist, the twist. So I was like, fine, I will attempt to reread this thing. So I attempted to reread it. I got the 30 pages and I just couldn't anymore. It has such a chunky writing style. But because I'm just told constantly that this twist is apparently so amazing, even though the Goodreads score for this book is abysmal, I think I'm going, this is just gonna be a temporary DNF and I'm gonna get back to it another day. Because even though I don't wanna read this book, I have to know what that twist was about. So that was lame. And also don't look too closely at the cover or what's this part of the book called? Is it just the other cover? This is the dust jacket. This is the hardcover. Okay. Next up, we have a book I was kind of liking, but then just kind of like weirded me out. It's called The Need. If you were a fan of Blake Crouch's Dark Matter book, then this might be a good book for you. However, yeah, it was, it's just lame. I think I gave it a two. Basic summary. We have this mom. What the heck is her name? Sarah? It's Molly. Anyways, this book is about some girl named Molly. She's a scientist. She, she digs up fossils but not animal fossils, plant fossils. That's why there's plants all over the cover. Molly and her scientist team, they found this place that they called the pit. It's just like a rich treasure trove of fossils. But the deeper they get into digging, they start to find some modern day stuff, like a space action figure, a Bible, a little tin of out toys, those little mint things, I don't know what they're called, but they're a bit different than they should be. But these objects that the scientists keep finding, they don't make sense. Like the spaceman astronaut action figure, he has a monkey tail. The Bible, all the pronouns for God are her instead of his. The little tin of mint, it's bigger than it should be. It's like all these Mandela effect things. And so the scientists team, they keep all these treasures, they put them on display, they bring tour groups in. You know, because they have a pretty blasphemous Bible, they also get like death threats and stuff like that. But hey, these tour groups, they, they get them some money. Meanwhile, Molly, she loves her job, love being a scientist, but you know what she likes more? Being a mother. She's got this precocious little girl toddler. I don't know her name. She has this newborn bouncing baby boy. I don't know his name. She, oh, she's just in love with her kids. Love, love, love. Her husband seems like a bit of a freeloader in my opinion. He's not helping. But one day at the house, she's just taking care of the kids. She feels like she's being watched, which doesn't make sense. She's home all alone. Her husband's away doing his job. She's got her daughter. She's got her son. And she's hiding away in her bedroom because she's hearing the creak, creak, creak of someone in her house walking on the floor like you normally do, boy. But you know, it starts to quiet down. She thinks she's safe. So she takes her kids out of the room. She gets to her living room and she's got this like, you know, like a chest. It's a chest you'd put your toys in, stuff like that. The lid of the chest in the living room is like, it's moving. It's opening. You know what comes out of it? A freaking person wearing a deer head. Y'all, if you know me and you know that I've read Imaginary Friend and The Only Good Indians, you know I have a phobia deer. This freaked me out. Molly's like, oh my gosh, what the heck? And Mr. Deer Person is like, come with me or you'll regret it. So Molly gets the babysitter on the premises and she follows the deer person and crap goes down. Literally cannot explain anymore. Super short book. However, if you, you can guess what the deer person is just by what I've already told you. A lot of the moments in this book, it's like I told you, it's a scientist lady, but that's not really what's happening. A lot of the scenes in this book is literally just devoted to the little tasks of being a mother that feel so gigantic in the moment. Like changing a diaper, trying to get the kids through a grocery store without both of them throwing a tantrum. Meanwhile, we got the shenanigans with Deer Person. And when the story goes to Deer Person, I don't know what this book was trying to accomplish. The ending was so vague. I don't even know what this book was trying to say with its point. It also had a very, you know, for a science lady's point of view, it was, it was very flowery writing style. And in that, it was just so confusing. I couldn't tell most of the times whose point of view we were in because all the main characters in this book are female and have 
literally the same, if not similar names. And most chapters will just neglect to tell you, oh, this says her point of view until you're almost done with it. So I think in that regards, it was just very messily written. The ending again is just so weird. There is also a sudden bomber in this book. I have no idea where this bomber came from, why they are so important, but they're just suddenly there. In short, it's just one of those books that's trying to sound really important without being good with words like me. If this book had a human equivalent, someone who uses big words without really knowing what they mean, it's, it's us, because I'm officious. Okay, next up, I got two more books, and they were both such disappointments, because I was so excited to read them. One of them I have to do a separate dedicated review for. But first up, we have my best friend's exorcism. I was so excited to read this book, but ended up giving it a one. Beautiful points for the cover though. Love it. So we have these besties. We have our main character, Abby, and her best friend, Gretchen. These two, they've been together through thick and thin. But you know, they, they start out kind of like sweet kids. Then they go through the puberties and they get all nasty. They do the drugs. They start the skinny dipping. And then one night they go to a crazy hoedown with their other friends and they start passing the devil's weed. They start getting the highs. And one of the girls is like, let's go skinny dipping. Yeah. And Abby and Gretchen are like, yes, please. So in the midst of all this fun time, Gretchen goes missing. We find her much, much later, very naked and very confused, just hobbling around in the forest, very zoned out. The girls freak out, but you know, they were doing the drugs. So they're like, let's not call the police or our parents. Let's pretend this didn't happen, so hush. So Abby takes Gretchen home. Then the next day happens. Gretchen looks like a mess. She's haggard, like shadows under her eyes. She keeps vomiting this white stuff with feathers in it. Feathers. Gretchen starts acting abnormal, as if she's no longer herself, like she's being possessed. She's just acting crazy, y'all. All of her friends are dropping her, except Abby. But even Abby's like, girl, you're too crazy for me. I gotta leave, but she can't leave. That's her best friend. So Abby's trying to compile all this. Just what the heck's happening with my best friend? She's trying to find out what. Then she starts to put two and two together and realizes she might need to, might need to do an exorcism before there's nothing left of her friend to recover. So I've come to a realization. I hate high schoolers. But I realized why I hate high schoolers. Some of them in books. But previously, I thought I didn't like them because they were so shallow. In books like this one and Before I Fall by Lauren Oliver, they're very shallow. They talk like how an adult would think a teenager would talk about ever having kids or having been a teenager themselves. Shallow. Hormones just everywhere. All they can do is talk about parties and sex, which yeah, that's typical teenage interest. But in a good book, there's more to people than that. I think what I hate about books like these is that they're just the stereotypes of high schoolers. And so yeah, in this book, they're all just stereotypes. They're shells of high schoolers, the most superficial aspects of them. None of the people really have a personality besides, oh my gosh, cheerleader popularity, makeup parties. That's it. So I didn't get attached to any of the characters, unlike the last Grady Hendrix book I read, which was The Southern Book Club's Guide to Slaying Vampires. My favorite character in that was Slick. Love Slick. I still think about her a lot. And also, there were scenes in The Southern Book Club's The Hat. Oh, that grossed me out so, so much. And they're still like engraved into my mind, but in a good way. This book, was so lacking in horror. Like, I wasn't scared at all. I didn't feel any tension because like the exorcism part is just like in those last 60 pages and there's no real build up to it. The ghost barely makes an appearance, ghost, demon, whatever he is. Just wasn't worth it up to the end. However, there is one scene which I was like, oh my gosh. I'm actually convinced that was the real exorcism. When I like announced I was gonna read this book, Book Boop, love her channel, go check her out. She Instagram messaged me. She's like, girl, when you get to that scene, you'll know what I'm talking about, DM me. I finished the book and she texted, she's like, did you get to that scene? And I knew immediately what she was talking about. I can't tell you, but if you read the book, you know what it is. There's an old TV show on Nickelodeon called Mr. Meaty. It's about puppets that own like a fast food restaurants. They had basically the same scene 
that was in that book in that show so that brought me all sorts of flashbacks and yeah it was just disgusting <laughs> but i wanted horror and i got horror in just one scene of this book so no real payoff i'm sorry y'all i got like a charlie horse in my leg time out for a second so pro tip from Casey, whenever you feel a charley horse happening, you take your other healthy leg and you kick the other leg. That shows your dominance. So yeah, no real build up to anything. Hated all the characters, only one scary scene. Oh my gosh, and the ending is so cheesy. Like, I gave a Southern Book Club five stars because it had a self-aware cheesiness to it, but this one just felt like a lame let down cheesiness. The exorcism scene where they like, exercise the spirit in the name of Phil Collins. All right, if it works, it works, I guess. Didn't know there was a church of Phil Collins out there. Also, the girl is so stupid in this book, okay? Exorcism scene, the demon is making all these hallucinations happen. And also, the exorcist, he looks at Abby, because we got our girl Gretchen tied up on a table. An exorcist guy looks at Abby, and he says, she is going to trick you. Nothing you'll see is going to be real. Don't talk to her. Don't pity her. And we'll make this happen really fast, okay? Our girl Abby can't shut up for a second. Gretchen just made some little tiny, you know, whimper sound like, uh. And Abby's like, oh my gosh, we're gonna let her go. I can't do this, uh. Girl, let's get the demon out of her, then take her to the hospital. Oh my gosh, chill for a second. She's just so whiny. I mean, this whole exorcism was your idea in the first place. Just get it over with. So yeah, I hated that book. And now for the biggest disappointment of my life besides being born with this face, Survive the Night by Riley Sager. A oh, good golly. My favorite authors, Christopher Paolini, Riley Sager, you're letting me down. You're slipping like this book from the jacket. So if you know me, you know Riley Sager is my favorite thriller author. I've loved all of their books. My favorite one being Lock Every Door and It's Green, Survive, nope. Home Before Dark, that's it. Survive the Night starts out really cool because it's gonna have that cramped, claustrophobic environment that I like in the thriller. So we have our girl. Charlie loves movies, mostly because she can't stay in real life. Horrible things have just happened to her. She's a college student. She's befriended her roommate who was her best, best, best friend. And you know what happened to that best friend? She and Charlie got into an argument. Charlie left her alone at a bar and her friend got murdered. Yeah by the infamous campus killer at their college. Charlie is just riddled with guilt. And so she's like, you know what, screw it. I'm dropping out of college, I'm going back home. Peace out, I'm gone. But she don't have a car. Yeah, that's a problem. So she breaks up with her boyfriend who's like, oh please baby, don't go. You can stay with me, sugar plum. She's like, I can't, the memories, ah. Like normally he would give her a ride, but he just can't because he has a work, he has a job to do. So she gets a little piece of paper saying, please give me a ride. And she puts it up on her college uh, drive share board. And as soon as she puts it up there, there's this guy. He's coming up to the drive share board. He looks at her and he's like, oh, you're going to the same town. I can give you a ride if you just split the gas money. And our girl Charlie, who wasn't really expecting anyone to like offer to take her to back home. She's like, yeah, let's do this. So they meet up the next day. Charlie's got all her junk in the trunk and she and this guy, Josh, just head on out. But the more they're driving, the more our girl Charlie is convinced that the dude driving next to her is the very guy that killed her best friend. And she's going to be next. So it sounds cool, right? No, it's not. So first off, I was able to guess who the campus killer is immediately because, so this is what I do. I read like 50 pages of a thriller and I just automatically make a wild theory. Like this is what would happen if the book is stupid. That's the theory that would make the book bad. And I keep that in the back of my head. And as I was getting more and more into the book and I just saw how poorly it was handled, the stupid wild theory just got better and better. Not better and better as in, oh, this is a good twist. I, better and better as in, yeah, this is definitely gonna happen and that's bad. I wasn't personally attached to Charlie at all, mostly because she's an unreliable narrator and those drive me insane automatically. She'll zone out of reality and have these movies play in her mind. Like, I'm just gonna call them hallucinations. Like how she thinks something is happening. Like she could be paying for a meal at a restaurant and she'll see one of these movies in her mind that the place is getting robbed and she'll see herself acting out what would happen if it was really getting robbed. But 
it's just a hallucination. She's really just there standing in line. Everything's perfectly fine in the restaurant. So she would just like zone out and be like really still for a bit. So that automatically makes a lot of the conversations and encounters in this book really confusing because you don't really know what's real and what's not. Is she really saying this to this guy? Or is she really not talking to them? This is just in her head. Also, this actually surprised me because we have multiple point of views in this book, which I don't think's been done by Riley Sager before. And also, one of the point of view chapters, not Charlie, some other person, straight up lies to us. I get that in a thriller, you're supposed to deceive the reader, but you're also supposed to throw the facts in there so they can put the pieces together. We're talking about the culprit, okay? We're in the culprit, the culprit, the killer's point of view. So we're in his thoughts. And while we're reading his thoughts, his point of view, it's written as if he's perfectly innocent. No, if we're in his mind, he's not gonna act like he's innocent in his mind. He's gonna be scheming and stuff like that. He's gonna be planning. Unless he's just an insane method actor and he's convinced himself that he's this person for now, then the book is just straight up lying to you. Also, this is just a bunch of idiots in this book. One person in this book has to come up with a cover story, like an, mm, an alias of sorts, and they pick the worst possible one, which would not work under any situation, under any circumstances, but they go with that anyways. The main villain, when we finally get to them, the revenge plot, whatever it is, it's just so thoughtless, like it hasn't been thought through all the way. Because the person they're trying to get to literally has none of the information that they want or need. And they know this. So they were dumb, the other person was dumb. And also, this book ends in one of the worst ways, or the worst endings I hate in all books. I can't tell you what it is, but it's a, it's a common cliche in books and movies. And oh gosh, it was so sad. I need to, I need to film a separate review for this. I can just go into all the spoilers. And we're gonna end it on a semi-positive note. The only three star, mildly, mildly fine book I had this month is called Follow by Frost. So I'm gonna be doing this series on booktube on my channel where I review books that have ugly covers to see if there's something good inside. This is the first one I'm doing. I'm also gonna film a review for this. But in short, this book is exactly like Frozen. You know, the major plot point. Minus like trolls and reindeers. We got camels though. Give me a hug, Maggie. I love you. I, I love you. What was I talking about? Oh yeah, Followed by Frost. It has an ugly cover, but I read it anyways. It has most of the plot points of Frozen because it starts out with this girl. Now, she's a little nasty little thing. She's all, oh, I'm the, I'm the, I'm the, I'm the uh, I can't talk. I'm the hottest thing since spaghetti. I'm gorgeous and I know it. Let me flip my hair some for the boys. I'm spoiled rotten, I'm uber rich. None of the boys in my village deserve me. But you know, she is a pretty thing, so she catches the attention of this new guy in town. I think his name is Morin, but I always call him Morgan in my brain, so I'm gonna call him Morgan. Morgan, he's like, well, hello, pretty lady. Would you wanna go on a date with me? Oh, please. And our girl's like, yeah, oink, oink. You know, meet me at the docks tonight. We'll have a little smoochin' by the docks. And so Morgan's like, oh, gee whiz, that sounds awesome. So he goes to the docks. Guess who doesn't show up? That's right, our little girl, wh whatever her name is. Oh, it's Smitha, that's her name. Smitha's just sitting in her room now like, hey, 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 hey. oh, he's gonna be so embarrassed when he goes to the docks and sees he's all alone. <laughs> I hated her in the beginning. And so back on her farm, she's just doing her thing and Morgan shows up like, ah, uh, witch, oh, why'd you screw me over like that? And so Smitha just like lights into our poor boy. <laughs> who's been nothing but polite until now. And he, he's justified in his rage, if I may say so myself. And Smith is like, you smell like rat bottoms. And other mean stuff, she's like, no one will ever love you. And so our guy Morgan, he's like, girl, you don't know what you messing with. I'm a wizard. Oh, guess what? I'm about the beauty and the beast this stuff. You know what? Your heart's cold as ice, so the rest of you is gonna be cold as ice. Fairy dust. <laughs> So yeah, uh, Smith is freezing now. Her hair's like frosting over. Her skin is like cracking and stuff, like, like 
like ice. This storm cloud of just ice is surrounding her. It's making the crops die, the grass die. She can put her hands right into fire because she can't feel the warmth and it doesn't hurt her. She is doomed to be cold for the rest of her miserable life. Oh, and the town that loved her, her face, so that's all she was good for in the beginning. Yeah, now they like kick her out after two days because she's killing their crops and children, you know, with the, with the cold. So now our spoiled brat Smitha is climbing the mountains all by herself, but not for long because the manifestation of death, who's hot, which I like, he shows up, he's like, hey babe, Come join me and be my queen in the underworld. You, you, you're cute. You know, our girl's like, you know, Ashley seems like a pretty good deal right now. But she abstains. And so the rest of the book is her, you know, countering Death's uh, proposal. His flirting advances. Also just trying to find a place in the world where her storm cloud of ice and wind and snow won't bother anyone, where she can just be left alone in silence. You know, it was pretty cute. It was a pretty cute book. Very basic, ends the way exactly like you're going to think it is. But I had a bad reading up, so I, I was fine with this. So there's like four guys introduced in the book. Morgan, Death, Prince Guy, and the final lover. Final lover was actually pretty good. I liked him. I thought Prince Guy was going to be the lover, but no. He was just a nice guy. I thought Death Guy was going to be the lover. Like in, you know, Addie LaRue. But no, he was just a jerk. I liked it. Our jerk girl is surrounded by jerks. It's fitting. But you know, she does grow up into a much more likable person. You know, she was a girl who was like, oh my gosh, those bonbons are raspberry filled. I want strawberry filled. But now she's like, oh, you're giving me mittens? Oh. <laughs> she becomes much more grateful. She actually does become grateful towards Morgan What's-His-Face for giving her this curse because she notices that, hey, she's kind of becoming a better person. You know, that is character growth. I applaud that. But this is a very short book and it's a fantasy. You know how in fantasy books that don't intend to do any world building, but still like, oh yeah, this is fantasy, so I might as well tell you what these things are called. It, the beginning of the book just like name drops a billion terms in city names like, oh, welcome to the city of blah, blah, blah in the, in the region of Lopanagandaga where we grow golden Indians and our king Frucka Frucka Flam is off the war against the Blagaders. Stuff like that. It sets up what these countries names right in the beginning. What's to the east, what's to the south, what's up above, I don't know. And then we just never talk about these kingdoms ever again. So it's very bad world building. Also, you remember Mr. Wizard? He never shows up again and I miss him. So that was kind of lame, but it was seeing the final romance bloom, the cocky flirtations of death. Actually seeing our girl Smitho get some friends, use her curse for good. It was pleasing, easy to read. It was just cute, nothing major. But after the reading that I had, I couldn't ask for more. So that's my very meh wrap up. Thank you guys for watching. I hope I read better books this month. Wait, I actually, where'd I put that book at? I just bought a book from Books A Million and I'm excited for it. I'll be right back. <laughs> oh my gosh, my left leg fell asleep. I'm dying. I found this in the clearance aisle. It took me forever to find out what this book's name is because there's like a billion words all over the title. It's called Born or Be Rectangle Run. So now this is like a mini book haul with one book. So we have this girl named Rachel and she survives as a scavenger in a ruined city, half destroyed by drought and conflict. The city is dangerous, littered with discarded experiments from the company, a biotech firm now derelict, and punished by unpredictable predations of a giant, a giant bear. Wow, you got a giant bear in the city. Oh, that's tight. Okay, so our girl, Rachel, who is a scavenger, Rachel Ray, who is also a scavenger. Rachel Ray, who's a cook. Conspiracies. Okay, so our girl Rachel, she's doing her scavenger thing in the city that has drought, conflict, evil tech company, and a giant bear. That's a lot happening. I'm excited to read this. But anyways, she finds this little organism who she calls Born. She takes him home because he's cute. Born is little more than a green lump. Plant or animal, she don't know but he exudes some type of strange charisma, which is weird to say about a green lump. That's like if I told people I love my pimple, he exudes charisma. I'm gonna do that now. So 
even though she's like, this thing's probably gonna kill me, but I'm gonna keep it. So she raises it. And you know, this little green lump somehow makes Rachel see the beauty of the desolation around her. Well, that's sweet, man. And you know, she, she gets protective over this little lump. But as Bourne grows, he begins to threaten the balance of power in the city, laying bare to Rachel how precarious her existence has been and how dependent on subterfuge and secret she's been. In the aftermath, nothing may be the same. So, this is a crazy cover. I like that. I like this part, especially about the bear and the lump. But also, it reminds me of To Sleep in a Sea of Stars. Like, our girl Kira comes in contact with an alien organism. I'm hoping this will be a better To Sleep in a Sea of Stars. I'll let you know, because I'm gonna bump this up into my, my TBR for this month, because it just sounds so cool. So I'm excited to read this. Does it match my dress a little? Not really. Well, thank you guys so much for watching. And until next time, stay reading, my friends.